Okay, so um, I've got four cases today. Uh, all right, the first one, as soon as my screen shows here, is a young woman. She's about 40. And assuming I can get my window. What's going on here? There we go. Who was involved in a high speed motor vehicle crash. And this was her trauma CT. And we've seen a couple of examples of this before, but you know, based on mechanism, she got a CT scan. And uh, the first observation is right here, just sort of at the, uh, just below the isthmus is there's this rounded filling defect in the proximal aorta, which would, um, under the current classification system that came out of the University of Washington and Journal of Vascular Surgery, would be one of these uh, minimal injuries of the intima here and, and based on the size but you know when you're under a, mil, a centimeter or so it'd be a, just a minimal injury and these are managed medically uh and uh, probably weren't even recognized when i was a resident when we were using four or whatever eight slice scanner we did probably three or four millimeter thick cuts um or we you know just didn't see them but what's interesting with her is she actually has two other sites of injury you know, come down. So the second most common location we see injuries is near the diaphragm. And she's got this little one here, which you only see over a few slices. And then there's a third one slightly lower down. If I can find it right here, just this tiny little one. So, you know, many of these would have been missed in the old days. And the good news is because we don't operate on them anymore, for the most part, they heal on their own and they can actually go away. So the, the current guidelines are to follow them. So this was another CT aortogram that was done a couple of days later, probably a little on the early side, but um, I'm sure you know, there, there's that one. And one could argue that it probably got a little bit smaller already as these thrombi resorb. And then there's um, the second one down low. That other little one is almost impossible to see. I think that one probably already healed. And then the second one down here also looks like it, it probably healed. So um, sort of showing the natural history of these. Uh, looks like she got pulmonary embolism though. There you go. I'll follow up. I didn't look at the report on this one. It was a, a case, but I'll make sure they know about that. But yeah, um, so complication of trauma. There you go, a little fusion. Nice. So minimal traumatic aortic injury. And the, our vascular surgeons have requested that we specify is it a transection? Is it a pseudoaneurysm? So if there's a hematoma, it's a transection. If there's not, it's a pseudoaneurysm. And then if it's a minimal injury, and if it's more than 10 millimeters or less than 10 millimeters of filling defect, that's kind of their standard now. All right, this is a case that, uh, another fun case. And this is, I have a biopsy that, I don't have the slides unfortunately, but it was done somewhere else. But this was a patient that uh, one of our my colleagues was asked to look at without any history. And you can see um, there's all these tiny little nodules. And uh, if Travis were here, he'd probably see that some of these are Cheerios, if I can find a couple of examples. Uh, some of them have a little, uh, here's a nice Cheerio, a little tiny Cheerio here. And this patient really didn't have much in the way of symptoms. And you see that there is some air trapping, and that's explained by, uh, at least by a diagnosis of asthma. Um, and these have been there for some time. So this was 2016. This is uh, 15 months later. And these nodules have all been stable. So uh, I know we've talked about these a few times. And it was actually a case of the day at the STR uh, several years ago, well, more than several years ago. But the biopsy confirmed what we suspected. And these are meningothelial-like nodules. Um, the pathologists see them all the time. Uh, no one really knows what they are. They're called meningothelial-like because they have appearances that are similar to things they see with meningiomas, um, and they can be near airways or vessels. And there are case reports, just a handful of these, uh, showing diffuse nodules in the chest. And they have this classic sort of well-defined appearance, very small, and many of them will have the central lucency, probably reflecting that they're oriented around airways. And they don't touch lesions. Um, we have a couple of cases here that we never biopsied, you know, there's another one there. You know, the differential might include longer on cell histiocytosis, but um, the distribution is too diffuse and non-smoker. So you will encounter right. that. We probably see a case of this every other year. Um, and once you recognize, and we often have many, the fact they don't change makes you feel a bit more confident about that. Um, I, I tried to find the biopsy report. It's buried somewhere in our electronic health record, but if we get the slides, I'll get some images. 
Uh, Chris Meyer shared this case with me. This is a cool case. This is a woman. She's in her 40s or early 50s, has a rare disease called Evans syndrome. And Evans syndrome is an autoimmune uh, hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia. And um, she developed in her lungs these peribronchial nodules that have solid and ground glass components. And you can see they're very airway centric. And very, um, very, re this one even has a little lucency in it, but very reminiscent of sort of the like the mucus associated or mucosa or bronchus associated lymphoid tissue you might see in a maltoma uh, or other sort of lymphoproliferative disorder. So somewhere along that spectrum, and you kind of have to worry about some of the more solid ones. So these also have an outside biopsy um, and a confirmed follicular lymphoid hyperplasia, which has been reported in association with autoimmune hemolytic anemias and Evans syndrome and stuff. But I looked into Evans a little bit more today. It's an extremely rare uh, disease. Um, but there are associations. So, you know, sort of along this lymphoproliferation, you know, we talk about LIP, we talk about follicular bronchiolitis. This is just these large nodules are aggregates of um, lymphocytes, and there was germinal centers forming. But probably would, we'll probably follow these just because there's a, there's, it's unknown really because it's so rare. But I think any of these has a potential to become lymphoma at some point. Now, a little cavitary one is a little, that's the older one. So, on the newer one, I think that could the cavity had gone away. So I don't know if she had a superimposed infection, but you can see they even get a little smaller sometimes. All right. And then another interesting case. Um, so we've talked, uh, we've seen a couple of examples in the webinar of cystic metastases. And I know I use one of Howard's cases of a sarcoma in one of my lectures. And I have a case of rectal cancer that had cystic met. So this lady uh, has an endometrial stromal carcinoma or sarcoma. I can't remember which one it is, but those are known to cause cystic metastases. And so we were looking at her follow-up and you see she has these large cysts. They're perivascular and almost look like the cysts you see in LIP. So I was curious, I was digging through her chart to see if she had, and they've been stable for many, many years. Now this little nodule here is growing and maybe a metastasis. But I was digging through her chart to see if she had a Sjogren's or some other autoimmune history. And in the initial notes, it described having lung metastases. And we hadn't seen any metastases recently. So I went back about five years and I found her PET CT, which is all I have with the chest. And what's fascinating about this, I need to link them up. Oh, let's see that here. Okay. Is that... Let's see my CT. Oh, I was trying to fuse them. There we go. Is what these were her metastases. So they presented as these large masses. Um, they were some of them were hy more hypermetabolic than others, but but they all correspond to the uh, the cystic spaces. Let's um, try to sync them up. And if I go back to the cystic spaces, like for example, this large one in the left lower lobe was a metastasis. I seem to have lost my tool to desynchronize them. I apologize for that. But so this is sort of the opposite pattern. So these metastases were treated and excavated and or just these cystic spaces have remained behind. And whether or not this is a metastasis was yet to be known. Um, but yeah, and they've been stable for, you know, five or six years. So I've, I've not seen that. I've seen, I've seen metastases cavitate and collapse down, but I've never seen the cyst persist. So I don't know if anybody's ever seen that. Yes. So we have a spectacular case of um, metastatic glancer, bladder, bladder cancer with big cysts all over the place. I can show that next time. Excellent. Okay. Well, that's what I have this week. Uh, David or Howard, either of you have cases? I have a couple. I have a couple. After. I'll go after David. All right. Let me clean things up here a little bit. Okay, here's a, <clears throat> here's a man whose chest radiograph is displayed here. Can we see this outside chest rentgenogram, everyone? Yep. Okay, this man has a history of coronary artery disease and was suffering a myocardial infarction. This was before he uh, was transferred to University of Washington. He has a little atelectasis in the left base, sternotomy wires in place. 
And then, um, let me see, here's what he looked like a few days later. He was developing more heart failure. So we're tracking him day by day. And then on the 8th here, you can see his, his diffuse lung disease, probably edema, persists here. He's got pleural effusion accompanying. And um, they determined that he had a, uh, a VSD caused by infarction and rotting of the interventricular septum. So he was treated with an Amplancer device. And this is a day, I think, or two after the Amplancer device was placed in his VSD. And you can see that it is embolized to the right pulmonary artery here. So um, they went in and snared this device and removed it. And they treated his post-infarction VSD with a larger Amplancer device because the area of necrosis was too big to hold this smaller Amplancer device. So we got a new one. And um, he still went downhill and he, and he died a few days after this of heart failure. So at this point, I think this, here's probably the second Amplancer device that's in place way down here, not the typical atrial septal location that we see these things put in. So this is the second device put in but it wasn't enough and he, he died from his um, ischemic heart disease with heart failure. So um, in the setting here of using these things for um, VSD repair in the setting of a myocardial infarction, it's not a, it looks as if it's not a very stable condition. In this case, uh, the thing tore loose and, and embolized. So, this wasn't embolized from the typical atrial location, but instead from the ventricular location. Okay, um, here's a uh, woman who has this imaging uh, from outside. This was actually from, from Duke, and it shows that she has this big chest wall lesion here. This is back in 2014, so she has this this thing down here, and then farther down in her abdomen, she's got some smaller lesions here in her anterior abdominal wall. Here's one, and there was another one down lower near the inguin, uh, the inguinal area. So down here, we've got this other uh, lesion down here. This one was resected, and this was considered to be a desmoid tumor, and she's got multiple desmoid tumors all over the body, so she gets the diagnosis of fibromatosis. So that's multiple desmoid tumors like this one all over the place. And as far as I know, her, her lesions were just in the chest and abdominal walls. And she was recently seen here now four years after the time of this CT scan. This lesion had, was, had regressed after the, after the uh, resection, didn't come back. Her um, thoracic lesion um, was a little bit larger, but not that different from this uh, earlier scan. So it seems to be sort of a, a slow moving process, but fibromatosis, multiple desmoid tumors. I haven't had a chance to look this condition up yet. If you, you guys have seen this, right? Desmoid tumors, fibromatosis. Yeah, yeah. that one's in the, kind of look the same. Chuck, Chuck Roman had a case that involved the esophagus um, and mediastinum with multiple, you know, um, fibrous tumors like this. So I have to see what the usual distribution is. I just haven't looked it up yet. Okay, and um, then this is the case um, of a woman who had a um, cavitary lesion in her left lower lobe. And um, <clears throat> so she's in her young 40s, I think. And here's what her cavity looks like on CT. She does indeed have a left lower lobe cavity. And then there are all these big blood vessels near this thing. Let me show you on a soft tissue window. You can see that she has just enormous numbers of systemic arteries that seem to have left the mediastinum and the intercostal chest wall and have extended into the lung to form these ropey, ropey vessels around, around this cavity in her left lower lobe. So she was referred in for initially to our IR people. I think she was having some hemoptysis at this point, and there's a question of embolizing this. And she came in with a diagnosis of sequestration. But it turns out that she doesn't have a single or a couple of vessels that are um, anomalous vessels. She has really parasitized her 
intercostal arteries to get the systemic blood supply to this uh, cavity down here. And this is really not sequestration, but pseudo sequestration. And on a coronal view, I think you can see that the um, involvement here, let me show you posteriorly here. Look at all these intercostal arteries that have dilated up and become very tortuous and are feeding this lung thing. So this is not a pattern of vascularity that you would expect with sequestration. This is pseudo sequestration. And this all dates from an episode when she was 18 years old, you know, decades before when she had a pneumonia or aspiration pneumonia while in college. And that cavity uh, dates from that time, evidently. And it, it has acquired this blood supply because of inflammation of the pleura and intercostal arteries feeding across the pleura into this, into this lung lesion. You can see why she has hemoptysis. Uh, she's got all this vascularity around. So the surgeon, the, this was not conveyed properly to the surgeon that this was not a typical sequestration. He went to the OR. It took him hours and hours to uh, clear this lesion. There were dense pleural adhesions. It bled everywhere he tried to go. He ended up transfusing this person with 30 units of blood just to keep up because of the blood loss during this surgery. And ultimately, she did she did quite well. So this was really pseudo sequestration. We have this cavitary lung lesion, which you could take as a sort of, sort of a congenital cyst, and then you see systemic arteries. But that combination is not always sequestration. This was acquired neovascularity of the lung, not congenitally installed, factory installed, um, abnormal artery to the lung. So uh, pseudo sequestration. This is the most uh, dramatic case I've seen of tremendous um, vascular supply coming from the chest wall. David, another observation right on that image, if you switch to a soft tissue window, is look at the uh, intramuscular arteries in the left lower chest. They're also really big too, which which further supports your observation that this is all coming from the chest. A lot of it's coming from the chest wall vasculature. Yeah. You never expect to see that with a sequestration. And even coming up along the under the, interco the intercostals out laterally, yeah. Yeah. Very dramatic. It's strange why why this happened. It's why just, it happened? Just weird, huh? Yeah. You know, all it takes is um, is to irritate the pleura. So I've seen a similar sort of finding in somebody who had a spontaneous pneumothorax, a teenager who had a little hemothorax. He had placement of a pleural drain. He had a little hemothorax after that, and a year later. He had systemic arteries coming from his chest wall that had penetrated into his lung and were forcing blood retrograde in his pulmonary arteries and also entering pulmonary veins and you know systemic arteries supplying both arteries and veins in the lung and pushing blood you know back toward the heart and that was clearly not there a, a year before and it was picked up because. He was he was going to be a camp counselor, and somebody put a stethoscope on him. This is a very very good camp physical, by the way. I recommend whoever that doctor was. They put a stethoscope on him and heard a brewy, and it turned out to be the, the systemic arterialization of his lung that was acquired probably just because of the irritation of the pleura by hemothorax. So all it takes is to irritate the pleura, and uh, if you get pleural thickening, then it, it's, uh, I think, part of the healing response is to supply blood. And something encourages these intercostal arteries to proliferate and to invade the lung. So I, I can pull out that case, uh, show you next time. But it was a right upper lobe systemic arterial supply. It was way up here. And we have an intercostal, I mean, we have a, an angiogram, an arteriogram showing blood going back into the lung from these chest wall arteries. So irritated pleura, I've seen it. I've seen this also basically in the in the lung bases with uh, in people with bronchiectasis and chronic inflammation from that. So chronic inflammation leads to um, you know this proliferation of vessels. Wow, very dramatic. Excellent. I think Sudhakar okay. had a case that was pretty profound too of. Uh, so it turns out it turns out this entity pseudo sequestration does the term does exist in the literature. Um, there was some Korean article that that used it, and so I think it's it's a very important concept to teach residents so that not every systemic artery going 
to the lung is um, is there congenitally installed and therefore associated, say, with sequestration or systemic arterial supply to lung without sequestration. But if you have this proliferation of small vessels, in this case, large vessels, uh, it's really a neovascular pattern, and that should be termed pseudo sequestration. And the pathologist can get it wrong. The, the pathologist will see inflammation and see systemic arterial supply, and he will say, okay, this could be sequestration. So inflammation plus systemic artery is, is sequestration potentially to a pathologist. But if you point out the gross findings on, on your imaging studies, you can help steer the pathologist away from making that mistake. And David, I think that's important because there, there was a school of thought that sort of taught that interlobar intralobar sequestrations were acquired. And we know from prenatal ultrasound that that's not necessarily true. But right. a lot of them probably were pseudo sequestrations that they were resected. Um, the pathologist probably didn't have access to the CT or whatever imaging there was. Right, and um, yeah, it's true. So, and the, the latest proponents of that were Melissa Rosado de Christensen working at the AFIP 20 years ago. And she picked that up again, but that, that business had been in the literature, it seems to cycle every 20 years, it comes back into, into thought and it gets carried too far. So the fact is that there are cases like that where there is systemic arterial supply and there's chronic inflammation and it's pseudo sequestration. That does not mean that you can't have true uh, congenital sequestration. And the prenatal ultrasound is definitive, but before there was prenatal ultrasound establishing the diagnosis of sequestration, there were children with sequestrations who had no signs of inflammation and were very young. So it was it was already clear if you look at early uh, young enough kids that they had they had something that was installed in their lungs congenitally and was not acquired. So. I'm glad that that is now, that argument is dying away again, but through the 90s and stuff like that, that was being re-promoted by AFIP. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. All right, give me uh, show you this case. This case um, Leif told me about. Um, this lady came in uh, very ill. Let me just actually show you the appearance of her upper abdomen. So she has severe hematemesis, but when you look at the stomach, you can appreciate that she's got a very large volume of blood and fresh blood clot in her stomach. So unfortunately, she was bleeding very vigorously. They were struggling to keep up um, with blood and, and fluids to keep her from becoming hy severely hypotensive. She already was very hypotensive. She has a history of a paraesophageal, I think laparoscopic, paraesophageal hiatus hernia repair several years previously. And I think in the interim, she was fine. And then all of a sudden, developed this bleeding with tremendous amount of fresh blood in her stomach and coming out of her nasogastric tube. So the finding here is really subtle. So I'm going to show you on the sagittal rather than the, the axial. You know, the question is, where's the bleeding coming from, of course? So this is from the outside. Let me just mag this one up for you. And we'll go to the aorta here. And the place that we believe she has an aorto esophageal or stomach fistula is right here, right there. And uh, certainly consistent with that. And I assume that the blood in the stomach was, was bright red blood, but certainly there's for sure, I think the location of the aortoenteric fistula right there. So that diagnosis was was made on this really subtle finding, and I guess perhaps it's tamponaded off, but that's that's the totality of the finding we see in the aorta, consistent with an aorto 
esophageal or gastric fistula, depending on what anatomy she has there, right there. And that was it, really. Mm. Um, not a good outcome, unfortunately. They just couldn't get to repair that in time. Uh, let me show you this interesting case. Um, the time at which I saw this was kind of at the time that uh, interventional radiology had gotten involved in placing a drain into an abdominal process, but also simultaneously, they also, as I'll show you in a moment, sampled some of this. So I don't have the entire chest. Let me just go, well, let me just give you a feel for what the abdomen looks like. So there's a lot of pathology related to this thing in the abdomen. And I think subsequently a drain was placed in that. But you can see there is a lot of small bowel dilatation, small bowel pathology in the abdomen as well. At that time, let me go to the axial. Um, we did image enough to see what this pleural process looks like. So what is notable about this is that there are a lot of dystrophic calcifications associated with the pleural surfaces in several places, but quite a lot um, on the visceral pleural side, but also on the parietal pleural side. So that certainly goes along with chronicity of this pleural process, but otherwise it looks like fluid, perhaps more attenuating than just plain old water. So maybe it's kind of complicated fluid, but we have a combination of a chronic loculated pleural fluid collection with dystrophic calcifications with a pretty substantial intra-abdominal pathologic process. Let me just scroll through here to give you a feel for that. So because of, and I don't know what the patient's clinical state was, but they did decide to operate on this patient in the abdomen. So let me bring up the description over that. So here is the history. And you can see the operative findings in which they described a lot of inflammation in the upper abdomen, diffuse miliary deposits involving the intestine, mesentery, liver, stomach, and peritoneum. They took some biopsies. And you'll see here on the path report of some of the tissue that came out that we do in fact have AFB. So I think the combination of that with the pleural is very consistent with tuberculosis, just a very chronic tuberculous empyema, and then abdominal tuberculosis as well. And that kind of explains why I think this pleural fluid collection looks the way it does. Mm -hmm. Have you guys seen cases similar to this before? Chronic tuberculous empyema with other kinds of pathology perhaps, or just chronic tuberculous empyema like this too? Yeah, I, a couple. And, you know, it's interesting. I would expect his extra pleural, well, it's a little thick in there. I usually see hypertrophy, the extra pleural fat. Okay. And Travis showed a case of, it was abdominal peritoneal TB that looked like a tumor. And so someone picked up the miliary nodules in the lung. Hmm. Well, this person's lungs look fine, at least the portion that we see. Any, any calcified nodes or anything? No, not really. No, nope, I don't see any. Howard, do, do you have serial imaging to know that this um, pearl process was had had been there for months or years or something like that? I do not. I do not have that. Okay. I don't have any uh, older exams? No. Interesting, huh? Yeah. All right. This one is a nice radiograph. I wish I had the actual chest radiograph because as you'll see in a moment, in terms of the radiography, it's a very nice teaching case of findings of obstructive right lower and middle lobe atelectasis. So some of the notable features here are the recognition of the interfaces produced by here, the depressed major fissure, medial to which we have airless lung, 
And we also have opacity here consistent with where the right middle load is atelectatic and the minor fissure would be there. And you can see the very vertical orientation of right main bronchus. And you can see that the right hilum is not normal. It is depressed and rotated medially. And just very, very nice findings of obstructive right lower and middle lobe atelectasis. I wish I had a better lateral, but obviously we've effaced the right hemidiaphragm. The opacity of the atelectatic lung is going to be in there. And if we had a nice lateral projection of the chest, we ought to be able to see that the normal oval shaped or rounded opacity of right pulmonary artery is not there or not where it should be. And yes, indeed, this is tumor obstruction. Now it's a young person. So I'll show you the CT and you'll see this large mass that he has. Of course, already we see the bronchus intermediates disappearing and we see a large mass. And the most likely etiology is exactly what this is, which is a carcinoid tumor producing the obstruction. And here is the, the mass itself right there. Well, Howard, was, that, was it typical or atypical according to the pathologist or do you not? I'm trying to remember whether it was typical or atypical. I think it was maybe atypical. Um, he had surgery on the outside and came here for further evaluation. And the problem is that they may not have sampled all these nodes completely. So there is a bit of dilemma. In other words, what do these relatively big nodes actually contain? I think some nodes came out with the sample, with the surgery, but there is a question about these. And I think he's going to get some more imaging to help guide his therapy. But I think it was perhaps not a typical carcinoid, but I can't remember exactly. Yeah. It's it's quite hard. Yeah, my resident was tumor board and she says it was atypical. Did I get the discussion right? Yes. Yeah. So it's atypical and there's a question of what these nodes contain and that's a bit of a dilemma. All right. Okay, this one over here, it's kind of interesting how things come in pairs almost. So about two weeks ago, I presented a young person that came in with um, a history of a sore throat and I showed you folks uh, findings of Lemire syndrome with septic embolism, except in that patient um, there wasn't internal jugular vein involvement, but rather there was some involvement of the external jugular vein with the filling defect. But otherwise that patient had, well, at least had the abscess in the neck and had fusobacterium, and that was Lemier syndrome. So this person is also young. And let me just show you what she has here. So let's see if I can get to the right area. And you'll see over here we have a nasty looking posterior parapharyngeal process consistent with pus. I'll show you the history in a moment. And she subsequently had a drain placed in this fluid collection. And we go forward to, let's see if I have a CT from, I'm going to show you a CT of the chest from the next day. So again, now you see the drain in place having been placed just before that. And now we, we see this here, kind of subtle, but there is some abnormality right here behind the trachea in upper mediastinum separate from esophagus and adjacent to esophagus. And then I will show you over time how this portion here develops. So let me see if I get this right. <clears throat> so we have a couple days, about six days between these two. And you'll see, unfortunately, how this develops. So now it becomes pretty obvious that she has a descending mediastinitis and pus and gas coming down into her chest from that. So of course they had to go and drain that. This is pretty substantial pathology there. Wow. So this turns out to be, um, by culture interestingly, as I'll show you there, 
I'll show you the report where they, they drained the neck and then they did go into the chest, as you can see there. And this turned out to be, interestingly, strep anginosis. They came out of the fluid from both the, the neck abscess and the mediastinal abscess. And this poor person started off with what seemed to be mono and then got pretty sick and developed this. It's a pretty dramatic case of, in this case, whip anginosis, parapharyngitis, and descending mediastinitis. Is that a beta hemolytic strep, I wonder? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. I know we've shown quite a few cases of pulmonary abscesses and empyemas from strep anginosis. I think it's very much a pus producing thing. Yeah, it often does what staph does. And I think it's like the second most common cause of empyema after flu following staph. And it tends to, as Howard said, pus pockets. Yeah, pretty dramatic, huh? So they drained this. She's had issues with pleural fluid that they had to go and drain. But I think finally she's out of the woods, having had a, a rocky course with these bad things. And I think she's getting, finally getting better with a lot of antibiotic therapy and so on. Howard, is that thrombus in the ascending azagous vein, or is that just unopacified oh, blood? I didn't notice that. Let's have a look. Go down. Let me uh, go down further and bring in some. Right in there. See in the azagous? Right here. Uh, let me just mag that up. That's a good question. Oh, I didn't notice that, so that could be something. Let's have a look um, at the thins as well and wonder about that. If I have some. And I may not. So that's 22nd of February, 5th of February. So that is the same time. Oh, I wonder about that. Back in here. Yeah, I just. I don't know. I see that. I see what you're looking at. I'm not sure. Because it seems to start right where that big pus pocket is. I was just curious. I just haven't seen that going by. Yeah, that's a good observation. Could they be adjacent inflammation? It goes up and down quite a ways, though. It's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know. Or some strange flow phenomenon. Uh, the previous chest CT, didn't she have two chest CTs? Let's have a look, yeah. yeah hard to say. Hard to say, isn't it? It doesn't contain that much contrast, I don't think, at this time. I don't know. I don't know. All righty. I think those are mine for this week. All right. Well, I think that'll be it. We'll end a little early today. but so, let, let me just make a comment about this mediastinitis. The case that I showed back in 2014 uh, was also was a streptococcal species. It was uh, strep pyogenes, which is a group uh, A group A hemolytic strep, and that also followed a pharyngitis. So, and I think that's, I think pyogenes is, is um, a common cause of a bacterial mediastinitis. So it seems that strep is the nasty, uh, a really nasty actor in these cases. Yeah, pyogenes is the one that causes run-of-the-mill strep throat. So you get a you know, parapharyngeal abscess that goes south. Because that was a young, another young person. I, didn't that person die from it? He died, right. Yeah, he was uh, 46. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Thank you. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks, everyone. All right. Next week. <laughs>